shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine. worship every week at this point we take a couple minutes and we we just ask God to push our reset buttons because it's really really easy to come in here as just an extension of the week we've had and for many of us that week hasn't been the, the best thing ever but not just that it might have been bad but that it's just not focused and centered on Christ and that's what we want to be today. We want God to help us re push the reset button so that we might not miss our opportunity to meet with him. So let's pray for that very end. Lord, we are grateful for all you do. Oh, God, it was grace that first taught my heart to fear. God, I was blazing through life towards a terrible end and didn't even realize it. And you graciously stepped into my life. You showed me through the compassion and love of a friend that I was lost and undone. And then, oh God, you, through, your, through the ministry, through your ministry, oh Holy Spirit, you spoke to me in ways that were on the inside that I could understand. And you showed me that not only was I lost and undone before God, but that God loved me so much that he gave his son to die in my place. And then, Lord, through again the words of that friend, I knelt down in his living room and I, and I surrendered my life in its totality and placed it all in your hands to do with it what you will. God, here I am 35 years later. Listening for your command. Trying to obey. Falling, messing up, getting back up, starting over again. Lord, the love that you had for me long before I knew you has not abated. It has not diminished. God, your love for each and every one of us today not only is it immeasurable, it's impossible to improve upon. You could not love us any more than you already do. You just love us. Not based on what we do or what we don't do, who we are and who we aren't, but God, simply because you do love us. That gives us confidence in this life. So Lord, we ask you today to help us to revel, to bask, to enjoy your love for us God we ask you to push a reset button that we might leave that which we may be brought in the door and we might leave it behind right now and God we might focus our attention on you because this day is about you not us God we ask as the, as the music says right now that you would allow us to live in such a way that you truly are our all in all. Lord, this world offers a lot and delivers little. So God, help us to be yours and yours alone. That God, we might walk through this life, whether it be up or down, that we might walk with the confidence and the joy and the
the peace of knowing that we're yours and we always will be. Calm our hearts, calm our fears, and hear our prayers speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we ask you. strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my
we are so thankful. God, that you paid the ultimate price, you made the ultimate sacrifice. thankful for your son's blood, God, that covers us. And it washes us. And it reaches to the highest mountain. And it flows to the lowest mountain. I did in the first service and ask an odd question. Are there any Star Trek fans in here today? Okay, then make sure. No, it didn't. It, people left without even getting them. I've got some some memorabilia that I want to make sure that. Wait, wait, let me check. That one's open. That one's not. These things are like. 40 years old. Who else raised their hand over here? <laughs> it, it's actually a book with a RPM record in it. A and you, you read the book and you play the record at the same time. You, you, is that a raising your hand? You're just saying bye. <laughs> Anybody in your cl clan? It's just a memorabilia that I've had for decades. And I'm uh, sharing the joy. <laughs> And speaking of Star Trek, from 1987 <clears throat> to 1994, that was seven seasons, the Star Trek franchise aired a very popular series that won 19 Emmy Awards and had 30 million viewers for its series finale. And I'm going to put a picture up on the screen. It, it, I have more, too. I'm going to put a picture up on the screen. And I want to ask you if you can identify which Star Trek series this is from. Star Trek The Next Generation. You got it. Well, well, obviously, we're not here to talk about Star Trek The Next Generation today. But we are here to talk about The Next Generation. Uh, and if you'll think back with me, a few years ago, we had a, a, a family-oriented emphasis in our ministry focus here, and we called it the next generation. And today we're going to revisit that emphasis. As you may know, if you've been around here much, for the last six years, uh, we've watched God gather an unusually high percentage of families with small children here at Hope Church in Boulder City. Uh, obviously, that, as with most everything else, that, that, that has been uh, sidetracked for a little bit because of all the stuff that is going with uh, with COVID, but but because of that, because it was so clear that God was giving us a, a very real ministry to uh, specifically to children, uh, for years we've poured energy and resources into the ministry that we call Hope Kids, and while adding staff in the middle of a pandemic and economic downturn might not seem like it makes good financial sense. Uh, I would argue that it makes perfectly good spiritual sense to do so because the kids of Boulder City, those within our family and those without our family, uh, those kids need a Bible-honoring, Bible-believing, Christ-honoring church now more than ever. And we, we, we launched that uh, next generation emphasis from this passage in Psalm 33 that says this, it says, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. And just a, a very quick recap. This verse reminds us, uh, one, that the word of God is eternally applicable. 
the Word of God, when you read it, is just as applicable to today as it was when it was first written. And it will be just as applicable uh, as long as life, life on earth endures, as the old song says. But it also reminds us of something else. And that is, it is applicable to each and every generation, no matter how different they are from one another. And, and they are very different. Uh, you know, the generation that, that you grew up in was probably quite different from the generation of your parents. The, the generation that, uh, uh, that you grew up in was probably very different from the generation of your children, if you have children. Uh, and even in a generation that the generation that we find ourselves now, uh, it has been totally changed, derailed, and shifted gears because of COVID. So we, things change quickly and drastically sometimes. And the new reality that we are all living through right now obviously requires a new strategy for this eternal message. So, as you may know, we've taken a step of faith and we brought Kristen Estes on staff as our new Hope Kids coordinator. Uh, <laughs> amen. Uh, because God has, I mean, it's clear. All you have to do is just look back at our history over the last six years. God has entrusted to us an incredible opportunity to lay the groundwork and the foundation for the next generation to take the gospel work to absolutely greater and newer heights. Simply put, you can say it like this. The next generation is a big deal to us. God has called us to us and God has given it to us. So now we're going to go back to today's passage. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6 says this. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. First thing I want to do is address a very common misconception about this verse. Uh, that misconception is this, that this verse is written to only parents. Because when we read this verse, we pretty much read this. Parents, train up your children in the way they should go. I mean, don't we? That, that's, that's how we read this. But you need to understand, we've got to take our preconceived notions of what this verse says, and our, our notions out of the picture, and, and let this verse speak for itself. And here's what I mean by that. First of all, the word I have underlined, child, this is not the Hebrew word for offspring. This is the, a Hebrew word that just simply means a young person, a young child. Not it, it, and it also th this passage this verse has no possessive nature to it. Like for instance, if I were to say, just pick up some pick somebody and, and say, Brooke, your child. We know that you're we're talking about Logan here. Uh, where did Logan go? Oh, he's working back in the sound booth. Good on you, dude. <laughs> and, and so. We, but the, 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 to say your child, there's a possessive uh, sense to what I just said. It's her child. There is none of that in this verse. So even it, it says train up a child in the way he should go. And it doesn't say anything about the child. The word child doesn't mean offspring. It just means a young one. It, you could even say something like train up children. And that changes the way we hear it. Train up a child in the way he should go. And there's no possessive nature to it. So w it, you could say it like this. Train up the young ones in the way they should go. And so that changes everything. Because before we, we saw it as parents. Train up your children in the way. Should, but we were the word parent in it, it isn't in there. And the your child thing isn't in there. So when we hear that raise up children in the way they should go, well, wow, that sounds like it's to us, and it is. This verse is written to the people of God when it comes to dealing with the next generation, not just to parents within a household. Now, obviously, this is applicable to parents, no doubt, but it's being spoken to all those who make up the family of God. You know, it's kind of like the old African proverb that says it takes a, 
uh, it takes a village to raise a child. Now, let me pause right there. I recognize and totally reject what that phrase is sometimes used to do because sometimes that phrase is used to undermine parental authority by people who want to impose their standards on your children. That's not at all what I'm talking about here. What I mean is that as a community of Jesus followers, we have the responsibility to come alongside parents to raise children. Not that we usurp the authority of parents, but that we come alongside and help them in the proper role raise their children in the way they should go. Because it takes, it really does, to have a good, broad spectrum understanding, a Christian worldview, and know how to be salt and light in the world, we all can play a part in that. And so that's our, that leads us to our big idea today. Our big idea today is this. It is wise to give priority to training and shaping the next generation. It's not just a parent-child thing. It's a family of God, next generation thing. So today I'm going to answer three important questions about this. The first one is, why? Why is my responsibility to the next generation so important? Well, the, the first of the two answers I want to give to this is that the next generation matters to God. The next generation matters to God. All you have to do is look at the New Testament when Jesus was traveling and the apostles were trying to say, oh, no, kids, you're, you're not important. Stay out of the way. We're, we're, we're doing big church stuff. Thank you. I needed that. <laughs> you know, we're, this, we're doing adult stuff here. Jesus said, what do you think you're doing? Stopping the children from coming to me. He obviously put a high priority on kids. Because the next generation does matter to God. In fact, it matters so much that God has commanded us to teach them His ways and to remind them of His goodness. It's our responsibility to help parents teach children God's ways and to remind them of His goodness. Look at Psalm 78, 5 and 7. For He, God, established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children that the generation to come might know, even the children yet born, yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children that they should what? Put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep its commandments. This is a generational passing of a baton if you will because God has given us in the scriptures God has given us a framework of standards that make it possible for us to live life in such a way that's pleasing to God and therefore enjoyable and satisfying to us and when we follow those standards he rewards us by bringing joy by bringing joy and satisfaction to our lives when we walk closely with God, we enjoy satisfaction and we get to enjoy life. I mean, look what it says in Proverbs 7. It said, my son, keep my words and treasure. Now, keep in mind, this is, this is Solomon speaking to his son, passing the, the, the word of God on to his son. That's why he says, keep my words and treasure my commandments because they are God's words and commandments that he's passing along. My son, keep my words and treasure my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live. Now, like I've said twice in this series already, this verse does not mean keep my commandments so that you can have biological life because I'm going to take you out if you don't. That's not what it means. What it means here is to keep my commandments and enjoy life to the fullest because that which God has built into living His will and His way and His word, when we live that out, we get to enjoy the fullness of what God has for us. When we ignore it, we're just left to our own devices. We can only extract out of the world's methods, we can only extract out of that what the world offers. And it's not joy and satisfaction. Now, it's fun sometimes. No doubt, sin's fun sometimes. 
if sin wasn't fun, the devil would be out of a job. Nobody would sign up. Sin's fun sometimes. But there's always payday someday. There's always a reckoning. And God makes sure that when we live according to His will and His word, that we get rewarded for it. And He makes sure that when we live contrary to His will and His word, that we're punished for it, that we pay for it. He leaves us to our own devices. But listen to this verse as well from Psalm 16. You will make known to me, this is God, you will make known to me the path of life. In other words, a path of enjoying life, a path of living life to its fullest, that which you have for me, to the path of life. Your presence, in your presence is fullness of joy. What's that tell you there is out of his presence? In your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your right hand, the idea there is is something that's ready to be given. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. God holds the keys to us living a life that's full of joy and satisfaction and purpose. And God has given us the clear responsibility to make sure the generation, next generation knows this. That's up to us. Because that's not the message they're getting from the world around them. It's not the message they get apart from us, apart from the, those who care enough to share with them the truths of the will and ways of God. Well, the second reason our responsibility to the next generation is so important is that the next generation matters to God's redemptive mission. Not only do they matter to God because just simply who they are, the innate value, the intrinsic value that God puts in each and every single human being, not only does, is, does he... Are they important to God and they matter to God because of that? But they also matter to God because He uses people for His redemptive mission. You know, if, if we were to sum up the, the Bible as a whole story, uh, it would basically be that God's on a mission redeeming people to Himself from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people. And He's drawing those people unto Himself. But He accomplishes that through His people. For some reason, God has chosen to leave in our hands, to some degree, the success and failure of His mission. He has put it in our hands. I don't think any of us fully grasp how important that is and the responsibility that goes with that. And one day, some generation will be the one to finish that mission and usher in the return of Christ for His people. Jesus Himself talked about it in Matthew 24. He said, this gospel of the kingdom, this good news of the kingdom of God shall be preached. And the word preached there doesn't mean just what I'm doing. It preach means to be heralded, to be proclaimed. And I'm not the only one that can do that in this room. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. That, that, that last part of that almost sounds bad if you didn't know what the end looked like. Then the end will come. But the end is us walking through. I really, really, really hope that Jesus comes back when I'm standing behind this pulpit. <laughs> I want to I wanna go with my boots on. <laughs> but you know, it might just be that little boy in your classroom that insists on getting up and disrupting the whole class every day week that is the one that shares the gospel with that last soul and then the sky busts open and Jesus comes back it could be the little girl that's in your classroom that just will not stop asking questions that teaches a bible study and some, some friend is one to Christ 
and the sky busts open and Jesus comes back. It could be that teenager that right now you want to pull your hair out over because they push every single boundary anybody puts in front of them just because that shares the gospel with one of his or her friends and they're saved and the sky busts open and Jesus comes back. Second important question we're going to answer today is what is my responsibility to the next generation? Well, it's right there in, the, in, in our verse. It's actually, you could sum it up with just the first word of our verse. Train. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. There are two very important things in this phrase that you really have to understand to understand what God is trying to say to people here. We, those, there, there again, we have, to, we have to push past those preconceived notions about what we've heard said about this verse so many times. Two important parts of this sentence. First of all, the word train there means more than just making sure that your child prays at night and occasionally learns a Bible verse. This isn't just about t- training a child in the spiritual realm obviously of utmost and primary importance. But this is a holistic idea here. The, 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 the Hebrew word is kanak, and it speaks to a holistic approach of lifestyle instruction. Commonly in our vernacular in the Christian circles now, we say to have a Christian worldview. In other words, not just to say, okay, Sunday, this is how I view Sunday. The rest of the world... The rest of the week, this is how I view the world. No, it's Sunday, I come to learn more about the things of God so that I can see the world through those things. It's a Christian worldview where we take that which we know about God and we run everything we're exposed to through that filter to help us to understand it properly instead of just according to our own understanding. It's the spiritual, it's the physical, it's the mental, emotional, it's how to make wise decisions, how to handle money, how to manage anger, how to be good stewards of our bodies so that we live holy before God without regrets. It's all of that. That's what he means here by training the children. But there's an important component here that's usually totally missed in addition to that one. And that is the second part of this phrase, train up a child in the way he should go. Obviously, this this applies to boys and girls. But the idea here is train up a child in the way he or she should go. Meaning that it's, yes, there there are these broad spectrum standardizations that God has for his people to live by. But when it comes to the individual, there are specifics that apply to them and them only. Look around the room. Nobody in this building is like anybody else in this building. We are not carbon copies of one another. We have a lot in common. We, we, two legs, two arms, some of us have hair. Some of us don't. We're pretty much alike. But we're very different from one another. And that's the emphasis here when it says in the way he should go. Um, Literally, you could say it up this way. You could say it this way. Train up a a child in his way. Not, Not like everybody else. Well, there, again, in the teaching of children, yes, but when it comes down to it, you've got to help kids know who they are and live the life God has chosen for them. Every human being is created by God and has a specific, and He has a specific purpose for them. That's not the same as the next. Listen to Psalm 139. This is from the New Living Translation. You'll recognize at least some of this. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, and how well I know it. 
You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. God knows what each and every one of our lives, He, he knows the best best that he has for each and every one of us and he knows how those days are going to look and he knows how he wants those days to look and that's why the specificity when it comes to raising up a child in the way he or she should go yes we have the the standards but the specifics are what this that verse is referring to So, back to our second question today. What is my responsibility to the next generation? Here it is. To guide the next generation to discover who God made them to be and to live that out for His glory. As parents, grandparents, teachers, principals, coaches, small group leaders, pastor, we all need to ask this question. How? Do I fulfill my responsibility to the next generation in Boulder City? Because that's the focus here. It's a, right where we are. This isn't some nebulous, hard-to-define group of people. No, these are the children of Boulder City, those for within our family and those who are not in our family that need us just as much. But before we try to answer that question, let's first remind ourselves what our responsibility to the next generation is. It's to train. It's to train up a child, train up the children in the way they individually should go. And in Ephesians chapter 4, there's a passage about how we can do this to help us answer the question about how do I fulfill my responsibilities to the next generation in Boulder City. Look at Ephesians 4 and 11. The first verse might throw you off a little bit, but just bear with me. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as teachers. The idea there is that Paul is saying God brings a church together. And remember this. Remember 95 out of 90, 95% of the time, I think it's 105 out of 116 times in the New Testament when the Greek word ekklesia appears, which is commonly translated as the word church, 95% of the time is talking about a local congregation, not the universal church. That does exist. But do not make the mistake of imposing the 5% translation onto the other 95% of the occurrences. So it's talk, we're talking local church here, here in Boulder City. God's saying here, the Apostle Paul is writing on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that God gave gifts to people, spiritual gifts to people. Some of them, those gifts, he calls them to use those gifts as apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. For what purpose? Well, of course, that's verse 12. For the equipping of the saints. God gives spiritual gifts and calls certain people to offices, if you will, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service and to the building up of the body of Christ. Now, you may be thinking, okay, well, I'm off the hook because I'm not an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, or a teacher. No, this is, this is the apostle Paul talking about one aspect of the God giving spiritual gifts. Now we're going to go to another passage in the New Testament where the apostle Paul is talking about another aspect of God giving spiritual gifts. But before we go, John MacArthur said of this equipping of the saints, he said the, the word equipping, in, in the King James it actually says for the perfecting. Um, and the word means to bring something to completion. But here's what John MacArthur said. This refers to restoring something to its original condition or that thing being made fit or complete. Now, the context here demands that we're talking about the second of those, the one I have underlined. Because... You can't restore something to a condition in which it has never been. So we're not talking about restoring people. We're talking about making people in the church. God gave these spiritual gifts and called these people to these offices to make the people in the church fit for what they are designed for and complete. So 
now we are going to move to, stay, stay with me, in 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul is further talking about the giving of spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Look at this. It says, but to each one is given. We're talking about spiritual gifts here. He's talking about God giving spiritual gifts to the church, to the local church. He says, to each one. There is not a single follower of Jesus, a blood-bought, heaven-bound child of God in this room today that does not have a spiritual gift that also has with it attached a role to play. He gave some as pastors and evangelists and teachers and pastors and 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 but he gave to others other things. That was just one aspect. Here's another aspect. Every single one of you, if you are truly a Christian, you have a spiritual gift and attached to that spiritual gift is a role that you are to play in this church, the church God has called you to. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit. That's capitalized. That says that to each one of us is given the, the, the incredible opportunity to have the Holy Spirit of God manifest Himself through you into the lives of others. Is that amazing or what? I, you know, sometimes I have people say, Pastor, that was a... a, a, a we were at the back door. There would be sometimes people say, oh, that was a good sermon. And I saw them. They were sleeping. They don't know what the sermon was about. <laughs> you know, they're just being nice. But sometimes it's a different story. Pastor, your sermon today changed something in me. Pastor, your sermon today spoke directly to me, and I now know how I'm going to address something in my life. That's different. I know when that happens that God has used me. God has manifest the spirit, caused the Spirit of God to manifest through me, uh, an unworthy, broken vessel, and, and, and into the lives of others make a difference. And if you are one of the each ones, God the Father wants the God the Spirit to manifest Himself through you, broken that you are too, into the and reach out into the lives of others and make a difference. But to each one is given the manifestation of the, that that's that's your gift. I mean that's not the specific spiritual gift you have, but this is what's gonna God's gonna do with it. The Holy Spirit of God is gonna dwell in you. And he's going to manifest his life through what through the gift that he gave you to make a difference in the lives of others. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You know, back in the day when Nell and I were in, in a different kind, type of church, uh, man, people all, they, they, they talked about spiritual gifts a lot. And it was, it just really seemed to be all about them. You know, so they, so they could be like, a pep rally and you know uh, oh I get to do this and then no spiritual gifts aren't for us they're in us they're to us but they're for the common good God gives us spiritual gifts and God the Holy Spirit manifests himself in us for the sake of others again in Ephesians 4 Paul points our responsibility to use those spiritual gifts to fulfill the role that goes with that gift. And then he tells us what happens when we're faithful to do so. From Ephesians chapter 4, he said, from whom the whole body, that's talking about a local church, the body of Christ in a local church, in that whole body being fitted and held together, by what every joint supplies. See, the, the picture here, Paul is using the analogy of the human body. Uh, again, it, it's like I said last week, the, uh, the parable of Jesus that we, sh that we shared with the, uh, with the talents. A parable is an earthly story, an earthly story with a spiritual meaning. 
The focus isn't the earthly story. It's just a vehicle that we use to understand the spiritual message. And in similar fashion, Paul is here using the analogy of the human body to help us to understand principles about the, the spiritual body. And so don't miss this. He says, from whom the whole body, that's us as a whole, being fitted and held together. There are some things that fitted means to be put together like a puzzle or actually, actually literally to be knit together. We have been knitted together and we are held together by something. Actually, some things. We are held together by what every joint supplies. The human body, it, this, this elbow holds this, my forearm on. If it wasn't, they'd just flop around everywhere I went. If you didn't have a joint right here to hold your lower leg on, you'd, every time you stepped on that foot, you'd fall. All the, the joints, the pieces, the ligaments, all of what holds our human body together, there's a counterpart in the church body, in the spiritual body. And it's us. We are the pieces. It says the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies. That means what you bring to the table, what you bring to the unification and the bonding of the pieces together. Somehow, it has come to be commonly believed that, it's, that if, the, if the church is strong and if the church is growing, uh, it, it's the, 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 church, the, the pastor gets the credit. But also, the this other side of that is if the, the church is, is, is contracting and the church is not healthy, well, it's the pastor's fault. No, I don't hold the body together. We hold the body together. If you, as a joint, a part of the body, are not doing that which brings together unity, it's not my fault. But I can tell you, the, the body suffers from it. It's your role. And to the degree that I am one part, my role. But it is our role. And then it goes on and talks about the second half of the verse. It tells you to what degree we do so. It says, by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part. So based on how well you accept that spiritual gift from God, how well you let the Holy Spirit manifest in you and work, use that gift to benefit for the common good, benefit those around you, to the degree to which you do that, the body is healthy. And to the degree to which you don't do that, the body is sickly. And look what, it, look what happens when we are faithful to do this. It causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Wow. The spiritual health of this faith family. And, uh, and therefore, our effectiveness to train the next generation rises and falls on your faithfulness. The spiritual health of this faith family and our effectiveness to train the next generation rises and falls on your faithfulness. How well we are held together and how strong we grow to be are both dependent on how well each and every part of the body functions according to God's gifting. So, to summarize the whole message, first of all, God commands that the body of Christ, the church, this church, not the church, us. Remember, the church isn't a building. It's not an event. It's a family to which we belong. God commands that the body of Christ, the church, train up the next generation. That's clear. Secondly, God equipped the people of the church with spiritual gifts so they could train up the next generation. That's clear. Thirdly, God expects the people that He redeemed from their sin to use their spiritual gifts to train the next generation while they're waiting for His return. God has a plan, and it is a good one. 
And for some reason, in his sovereignty, he has chosen to make that plan to some degree dependent on you and me. I don't know why, but he's smarter than me, so I'm deferring to him. God's done everything that we need. He's provided everything. And, you know, you look at this actual, this actual local church. This, we're financially very healthy. Even in the middle of a pandemic and economic and a worldwide economic downturn, we're very, very healthy financially. We're talented. God has brought a lot of talented people to this congregation. God has given spiritual gifts could you imagine what it would look like if every single born-again Christian in this congregation used their spiritual gift to the fullest? Wow, we'd be blowing the doors off this place. We'd have to install a permanent baptistry to keep up with the baptisms. And I'm okay with preaching five services on Sunday. Every time I preach, it gets more and more fun. <laughs> but just think what that would look like. That is actually the picture God has for this church. That every single born-again child of His uses the spiritual gift He so graciously gave for the benefit of the common good. And for some reason, he has left it, he has left, he has made our faithfulness a piece of whether or not what, what this church looks like. He has, he has left to us, the, to, to some degree, the success or failure of this church in each and every one of our hands. You know why I think he does that? For the same reason. That in that parable of the talents, that the that the landowner, the rich guy in the parable of the talents, gave them the three servants those huge sums of money to invest. He didn't need the return on the money. He already knew how to make money. He was rich, very rich. He gave them those talents to test them, to know who was faithful so he would know who he could trust with more. Look at, look what he did. Those that were faithful, well done, good and faithful servant. Yes, that's what we talk about a lot. But enter into the, the joy of your, your, your master and I will make you responsible for many things now. God wanted to do more with them. Remember, it, it wasn't just about the, the financial thing. It's an earthly story with a spiritual, with a spiritual uh, understanding, with a spiritual application. The important thing is the spiritual. He, was, he gave them those gifts to test their faithfulness, to see what they were going to do with it. And I think that's why God leaves it up to us whether or not we're going to be faithful to, to take those gifts that He has given each and every one of us and whether or not we, and, and that we get to choose whether or not to use them. Because He wants to give us more, but He's got to see if we're going to be able to handle it first. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful for all you do. <laughs> It'd be impossible to name it all. Uh, Lord, there are a lot of things that we recognize and we openly thank you for those. Lord, there are a lot of things that you do that we don't even notice, that we won't know in this life. Lord, we thank you for the clear uh, truth that you have given us first of all eternal life and secondly that you then gave us spiritual gifts for the common good and that thirdly that you will bless our fellowship our gatherings our church 
and you will use us for your kingdom if we will but be faithful with that you gave us. Lord, the next generation will not hear and learn about you from the world around them. We are your people. We are the one and only option for them. God, I pray that those who still have their sons and daughters living in the home with them, I pray, oh God, that you would help them to recognize the responsibility that they have before you and the privilege that they have to offer their children the goodness and the will and the ways and the remembrance of what you've done. And God, I pray that you would allow us as a, as a church body to come alongside them Lord, that we might help them in that endeavor, that, Lord, they, those, their children might, in turn, tell their children and their children and their children. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the way that you interact in our lives with us. Oh, God, help us to hear. Help us to know. Help us to be faithful. Lord, we say use us. We ask you, oh, God, to help us mean it. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. Well, normally at this point of the service, we'd take up an offering, but obviously we're not doing it like that anymore. And there, there are some different ways that if you choose to give to our ministry here at Hope Church in Boulder City, there's some different avenues through which you can do that. And the first one is that if you are here in person today, you can. Uh, we have a couple offering receptacles at these double doors on the sides. If you have a physical offering you want to drop off, just drop it in one of those. Uh, secondly, we have the website and an app. Uh, on the website, which is hopechurchbc.com, uh, and the app, if you don't already have it on your phone, you can te text Hope Church LV to 77977. And with either of those methods, as you go through the process, there's going to be a drop down menu. It will probably default to General Fund or something like that. If you, and th that's the destination for your giving. If you give, with that as your destination, the money will go to the main campus. And that's totally fine if that's what you want to do. But if it's your desire to give to us here out at Boulder City, let me ask you to check, that, click that drop-down menu and find the words Tithe Boulder City. If it doesn't say Boulder City, it's not going to go to Boulder City. Uh, and choose that in, in your giving if that's the way you want to handle it. Uh, and it's the same in both on the website and if you use an app on a mobile device of some sort. Also. If you uh, have a desire to, to mail your tithes in, you can mail them to Hope Church of Boulder City, 850 Avenue B, Boulder City, Nevada, 89005. Well, uh, folks, I am, you know, I tend to go over more in the second service. So if that bothers you, come to the first service. <laughs> but with the first service, I know there are people pulling up in the parking lot for the second service. With this one... Only, the only the only problem is lunch, <laughs> but uh, so we've gone over a little bit today, and uh, I, I, I want to say I'm sorry, but I think everything I said needed to be said, so I'm not sorry. <laughs> Deal with it, get over it. Well, I pray that you have a wonderful week, and I pray that God will find you faithful. Have a great week, folks.